welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the galaxy. Like Natasha said, my name is Mark, and we have a cavalcade of great movie news for you today. If you ever ask yourself the question, anybody want a peanut, this is the show for you. Natasha, what handsome gents are joining me today? Well, someone who is in a bit of a spicy mood today, Mr. John Schnepp. Hey, what's going on? It's just, I don't know why I'm feeling spicy. Anyway. Just spicy. Mm. And yeah. joining in on that sass is Christian Harloff. Oh, that's very interesting that you're so <laughs> spicy. <laughs> it's interesting. You opened with it. Maybe spicy mustard. Yeah. Oh, I just opened with it. Now it's got to be closed. Mark Elf, don't be so mad with Christian. Why are you so upset? he's got a different voice going on oh, right hey, now. Hey, we had a great show for about 15 <laughs> seconds, guys. Let's keep that one in the books. Natasha, please rescue us from these impressions. With our first movie news story of the day. <laughs> okay, Brian Singer's initial adaptations of the X Men franchise were contemporary stories set in the early 2000s. Director Matthew Vaughn's X Men First Class returned to the mutants to their comic book roots in the 1960s, followed by famously crossing timelines in the 70s set X Men Days of Future Past. Now, fans look ahead to the possible end of the world and the 1980s and the upcoming X Men Apocalypse. So, where do the mutants go from here? Speaking with ComingSoon.net, producer Simon Kinberg revealed that the next X-Men film will be naturally set in the 1990s. Though the report talks the next X-Men movie, some reports out there are claiming the 90s setting could be for Josh Boone's recently announced New Mutants movie. Mark, your thoughts on the next X-Men movie being set in the 90s? Well, my thoughts on it are that, yes, I have seen X-Men Apocalypse, as has John Schnapp, and we you know, obviously are not going to give away any spoilers to the end of that movie, but taking place in the 90s seems like the logical choice for either the next X-Men movie or for New Mutants, because again, we don't know which movie he's talking about. So if you're Wolfsbane or you're Cannonball or you're Sunspot, get ready for your close-up, because they might be talking about the New Mutants movie, but it does make logical sense that like, look, the 90s are where the X-Men franchise started, back way back in 99, and that was one of the big launch points of the comic book movie boom. So to have this be in the 90s and to see the X-Men with their powers and to be a team for a while, coming off maybe a decade or more so after the events of Apocalypse and then 20 or more years after you have first class in the 60s and you had Days of Future Past going all over the place. So the 90s seemed like a nice landing point for me, and that kind of gets me excited, whether it's X-Men or New Mutants. Schnepp, you're a big fan of the comic book series. How do you see this? Yeah, I'd like to see it either with the new team from X-Men Apocalypse but into the 90s or New Mutants in the 90s. I mean, I, I, Deadpool took place in, in the current, you know, in, in our day right now. I wouldn't mind seeing, uh, you know, an X-Men series in the in the present, so to speak, but I would also not be hating on it if it was a 90s version of the X-Men, because I loved all of the new characters they introduced in X-Men Apocalypse. You bring up a great point, because Christian, wouldn't you think it's essential to get Deadpool into the X-Men universe somehow, and do you think that this taking place in the 90s is going to hamper that at all? No, because I think that they have different movies that they're working on that they can do it leading up to it, but to channel Scott Mance, Mark Ellis, the first X-Men was 2000, no. not 1999! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Scott, <laughs> but in the 90s, it's exactly what you were saying, though. I think that they place a movie in the 90s that leads us up into 2000s. And then, yes, eventually you can get Deadpool in there because I think you can do a bigger jump. It does make sense. It's a little bit of a handcuff in a way because of the way that they have to set all this up with the f dating back to first class and then just the, the adventure that we're already on with these people going through the timelines. It's just I'm wondering how they're going to do it with the actors that they have, like how they're going to are they going to age them once we catch up? Like when are we eventually going to catch up? So it makes sense that they're going to do it in the 90s. But how long before we can catch up to get someone like a Deadpool in there? And will we do a movie um, in the X-Men universe that does take place in present? day so if you you know maybe you do something in the 90s it doesn't have to because again i have not seen x-men apocalypse so i don't know how it connects into the the version that we know today where, where the ending of x-men days of future past happened i don't know if that connects at all so i want to see if if the next movie they have is going to intertwine or not and again these movies are no stranger like days of future past pointed out to time travel so if you start something in the 90s it doesn't necessarily mean that your movie has to end there or even start in the 90s so you can go back and forth you can have flashbacks you can do a number of different devices if you want to get deadpool or x-force or any of these other characters in there in yeah. modern day Tail Schnepp, how important is that going to be to the franchise going forward to introduce a new character you can kind of latch on to, and will that be Deadpool? 
Um, I don't know if it'll be Deadpool, I, it, like especially in these next two iterations, whether it's New Mutants or an X-Men in the 90s. I mean, I don't mind them doing X-Men in the 90s and then three more years they go into you know the new, the new millennium, like mm -hmm. 2001 or two, and then catch up, so to speak, within the third film. So that could be a, a new trilogy, like X-Men Apocalypse kind of ends Brian Singer's trilogy, so to speak, and then this new trilogy could be 90s, 2000, and then the present day. I, I would hope that they go in that route. Will they use the music from X-Men, the animated series? Remember that? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, well, probably for the 90s one, yes. Yeah, that would be so, yeah. great if they did that. Yeah. That music that. was awesome. It was great. Some of the best <laughs> opening music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, okay, good. Right. Go ahead. Can you, so can you hum it again? I just want to hear like an acapella version like you guys. Yeah, yeah. That would be an awesome <laughs> opening. <laughs> no, now, now, it's, now, now it's really... We want to hear from you guys. Make sure you guys comment in the chat room that's going live right now as well as on YouTube afterwards. In a little bit, we're actually going to check in with our own Wendy Lee, who is monitoring the chat room right now so keep it classy and your comment might get read on the air there's wendy ready for the comments but not just yet let's go to our next story for us natasha According to a report from Deadline, Gail Garcia Bernal has been cast as the legendary Zorro, teaming with director Jonas Caron on a rebooted movie entitled Z. The movie, also written by Caron, is eyeing a false start at the Pinewood Dominican Republic Studios. This version of Zorro is said to be a reimagining of the character as a swashbuckler traversing a near-futuristic post-apocalyptic landscape, with some reports describing it as Dark Knight-esque. No release date has been set. Schnepp, what do you think of a post-apocalyptic Zora movie starring Gael Garcia Bernal. <laughs> oh boy. Oh good. <laughs> okay, well, they're here. They showed up for the Zorro story. <laughs> and they're not breaking yet. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Zorro in the future is something I've really been looking forward to for my entire life. Zorro in the future, post-apocalyptic Zorro. Yeah, sounds exciting. You know, this script has been kicking around the futuristic Zorro for like the last decade. The Z, the Z movie, where it's like, it's Zorro in the future. It sounds stupid to me, but uh, <laughs> good luck. Zorro in the future, yay. Okay, well, a nice little tinge of hope there, Christian. He found a silver lining, so he wished good luck to the Zorro production yeah. that you tend not to believe in. How do you see this? So we got Zorro, right? He's a swashbuckler. He's got a lot of attitude. He's got <laughs> the cool sword. He makes the Z everywhere. He wears the cape. It's nice and flowing. He's got the big hat. How is he going to play in a universe that's like the Book of Eli? <laughs> I'm curious about it, to be honest with you, because because of who's involved. And I think that it, it could it could absolutely be one of these kind of, if without this team, mm -hmm. Like a direct to DVD, like who cares about this nonsense? Is anybody just kind of grasping on the old legend, hoping it sticks? And that very well might be the case. But I have hope that this could be something cool. And I like the fact that it references kind of the Dark Knight. And maybe there's there's more of a darker tale to this because the last couple of connections that we've had of Zorro have been a little lighter and fluffier with the Antonio Banderas mm -hmm. version, which was fine and, sure. it, and it, it worked for what it was. But maybe if you want to do a new spin on it, then yeah, you should go down this route. So I'm curious. I'm not going to say that I'm excited about it or I'm not going to crap on it yet, but we'll see what the trailer looks like. Do you guys think that he fits in the post-apocalyptic world, though? Because it's one thing to have it set in the future. You know, it's like, oh, okay, a futuristic Zora. But it's another thing to have, like, a nuclear disaster or some <laughs> sort of zombie apocalypse or even the mutant apocalypse shows yeah. up. I think that might actually fit better. Yeah, but, you, so, could, you could have little Z's on all the zombies' foreheads. They're like Zorro. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Zorro. Yeah, but there's some, put a Zorro stamp. But there's something to that. It's like more, more that, that this kind of legend of hope comes out of this dark world. So it, it, there's there's something that could work with this tale. So again, not super. Like, yeah, can't wait for Zorro in the post apocalyptic sure. world. But there might be something we see, and we go, you know what? That actually looks kind of interesting. I but can't. if you're in, if you're in an apocalypse, like like I am Legend, right? Yeah. Like, like right. Will Smith, he woke up every morning. He was pretty much the only dude there. He didn't put on like a hat and a cape and like a mat. Like, why do you need the Zorro mask if you're the only guy walking around? And it's your. Is he gonna have a dog? Because if you're well, in the apocalypse, you need to have a dog companion. I think we can agree on that. I want the dog to have a mask and a cape too. <laughs> that would be great. In the future, all dogs will wear masks and fly? capes, and they can float for at least three seconds. Float. Three point two. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, let's get the decimals right. And our next story is... 
Gagadot has taken to her Facebook page to reveal that she has officially wrapped production on the upcoming solo Wonder Woman movie. She wrote, Today was my last day shooting the solo Wonder Woman movie. It's been such an amazing, exciting, dreamy, happy, and fascinating experience. I will cherish it forever. Thank you to everyone who was involved, our amazing cast, crew, and phenomenal director. Gadot will now report to the Justice League set to reprise her role as the Amazon warrior with production on the movie already a month in. Wonder Woman also stars Chris Pine, Robin Wright, Danny Heston, and Connie Nielsen. It is directed by Patty Jenkins and is set to open June 2nd, 2017. Christian, what do you think will get totally different DC film with Wonder Woman? Do I think we'll get a different one? Uh, yeah, we'll absolutely get a different type of film. And uh, take it to the bank. This is going to be the best DC film. Ooh. I think this is going to be the best DC film. In the modern universe. Well, to date. You're not talking about the Dark Knight and Batman Not Christian, I'm talking about the DC shared universe. This is going to be the best of all of them. I just have a feeling about it. I think that hearing the comments, and and seeing that little bit of footage that we saw when they did the, the DC special a yeah. few months back, um, I think that the talent involved, I think that Gal Gadot is, is really kind of growing into this role and understanding it more, and I think it's going to transfer over into Justice League as well too. But this is going to be... Um, a new feel. I think it's going to be a little lighter than some of the other movies. Not, not as It's still going to have, I think all the DC movies are a little kind of more serious in tone, but I think that there's more of that, that fantasy feel. We haven't seen a DC Cinematic Universe in that fantasy film. It's period piece. I think this is going to be a really good movie. I mean, call me a, an optimist, but I, I think this is going to be really good. I call you an optimist, and I'm right there on board with you. I'm just excited this movie is finished. Like, it's so cool that you hear about this movie, and it's like, oh, Wonder Woman, it's way off in the future. The movie's in the can, guys, and we have a little more than a year to see that movie, and for whatever reason, I am so optimistic about this picture, partially because of just that little, remember the, the image that we saw in Batman v Superman of her, and you see Chris Pine and his blue eyes and the black and white photo back there, and it's like, I am so intrigued with how she came to be, how these powers came to be, how she is now on Earth and walking around this place and, and all the different time periods it's gonna be visiting. So there were some production issues with this. I mean, you lose a director, you gain Patty Jenkins, you talk about making this movie with the, not an unknown, but somebody who's maybe her acting prowess was untested with Gal Gadot. And from all accounts on this set, we haven't heard of any of the other issues that you might expect to see on a movie like this that has been, you know, the DCU hasn't been the most non the line, you know, as far as like Batman v Superman, Man of Steel, and now going into Justice League. So I think this is really, really good news. If it isn't happening in the chat room, I, ho I hope it starts. Patty Jenkins. You know the Leroy Jenkins? Mm. Not really. It. <laughs> we'll check with bad. Wendy. Went over bad. my own lead balloon. Patty Jenkins, baddest director in the Leroy whole damn Jenkins? town. Does Leroy that Jenkins. Oh. Nobody? All right. Burn yeah. Burn yeah. I, <laughs> I'm very excited about this Wonder Woman uh, news. Uh, you know, it's like, like I'll echo what uh, Christian said. Uh, this this could be the, the best film because it's under the radar. I mean, they finished it. You're not, you haven't really heard anything. You haven't heard any news yet. We haven't really seen a full trailer yet. But we saw a little of that test footage and that special that they released a couple of months ago. And all, that looked really great. I love that it's in World War One. Yeah. And so, I mean, just like Captain America, the first Avenger, Wonder Woman is a person who's out of time. But also she's different than Captain America because she's... I guess sort of kind of like immortal in yeah, some way. Yeah, she wasn't way. sleeping. Yeah, she no. wasn't asleep no. the whole time. So <laughs> it'll be really interesting to see how they portray this character and, and I'm I'm 100% for it. Can't wait to see you the know, new trailer. That's the thing in Batman v Superman, one of the things that really stood out to me and, and it had emotional impact for me was when she was looking at that picture. When she saw that picture of her mm -hmm. and Chris Pine like back in World War One, I, I was like, can that movie come out like next week? Like yeah, I right. wanted to mm -hmm. see more of that. That's how that little image, just that image made me interested. And that's why I think this movie's going to crush. Yeah. And you talk about Wonder Woman's role in Batman versus Superman. And yesterday on movie talk, uh, Shanep and I, and, and Dennis, we broke down how Ben Affleck is going to be an executive producer on justice league. Right. And we think that's good news across the board because Batman was a shining star in B versus S as was Wonder Woman. She was one of my favorite parts of that movie, so anything more in her world that we get to explore, I'm on board for. Schnapp brings up an interesting point, though. When do you think we see the first trailer for Wonder Woman? Could uh, Now it's in the can, so now right. we have all this footage that we need to put effects into and then chop it up and put it out there in a two-minute digestible format. Could we see it at Suicide Squad? When's the release date? Uh, June in 2017. So it's over so a year from now. A little so over a Suicide year. Suicide Squad would be a it's great August. time to drop it. It'll be, yeah. it'll be less than a year by the time yeah. that comes just, out. Just, so, just, just give me a teaser. teaser. Give me yeah, that, like, that weird guitar sure. wah, 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 yeah, when she better. shows yeah. up. So yeah. we could see Wonder Woman footage sooner rather than later here, guys. Buckle your safety belts. Speaking of which, we're going to try a brand new segment here on Collider Movie Talk right now. We're going to go to our own Wendy Lee, who's been monitoring the chat room. And we asked for the fans' take on the X-Men movie, the new 
one whether it's going to take place in the 90s or not. Wendy, what are some of the nicer comments that people are leaving? <laughs> Well, a lot of them are saying the 90s X-Men cartoon is great and they want to see the theme song in the film score. And some of them are saying that they don't want to see it happen. They don't want it to happen and it shouldn't happen after Apocalypse. What were the fans saying about our rendition of the 90s theme song? Uh, they want you to sing it in the movie just like how you're singing it. They're but also saying that your camera lag is your mutant power. My, <laughs> my, my camera lag is my mutant power? Oh, nice. That sounds like something that I would bring to the table. Like mm -hmm. if Christian can fly and Schnepp can turn invisible, what can Mark do? He makes cameras go weird when he's in the room. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Natasha is going to give us gentlemen a premise and then we will say what our, whether we buy it, whether we sell it, and then we're going to throw some elbows. What do we got first, Natasha? Okay, according to a report from The Hollywood Reporter, Lee Daniels, the Oscar-nominated filmmaker behind Precious and The Butler, has exited the Richard Pryor biopic he was attached to direct. The Weinstein Company, which is behind the film, is said to have declined wait for Daniels' schedule to clear up. Daniels is an executive producer on Fox's smash television drama Empire, with another project at the network requiring a significant time commitment. Richard Pryor, is it something I said, is written by Bill Conn and chronicles the life of the comedian who rose to prominence in the 1970s. The movie has a star-studded cast set, including Mike Epps as Pryor, Oprah Winfrey as his grandmother, and Kate Hudson as Pryor's widow, Jennifer Lee Pryor. The Weinsteins will now contact a number of directors about the project this weekend. Mark, buy or sell Lee Daniels' exit from the Richard Pryor biopic. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll buy that he's departing it, but I'm going to sell that this movie's in trouble if Lee Daniels is departing. I think Lee Daniels is a very talented director, but I, it doesn't seem like, from reading this report anyway, that this is like some huge conflict that they had, where it's like, oh, no, you're not telling Pryor's story the right way. Mm -hmm. It does seem like it's just scheduling issues, and I understand that because, look, they want, they've been wanting to get this movie made for a while. They were looking for Richard Pryor, uh, somebody to play him forever, when right. they finally cast Mike Epps, which is a fascinating decision, by the way. I'm really excited to see what Mike Epps can do mm -hmm. with that. I think that if you need a director in place, then we need to get somebody else whose schedule is clear. My question is, is Bill Condon available? Right. The guy who wrote wrote it like yeah. is he can he just kind of jump in and wrote this material that he directed because clearly you need to get a director whether it's lee daniels or not that is passionate about telling this story the right way the story the legacy of richard pryor is something where he is maybe the greatest comedian that ever walked the face of the earth and he had so many demons in his in in his closet and there were some that were very public that came out during his time after his death but sometimes like when he set himself on fire and ran down sunset boulevard he was able to make light of that so you need a director that is talented enough to be able to tell his story in the glowing way that we revere richard Pryor as the comic but also not bad an eye when you're talking about what his personal life entailed and what he battled later on in life so i am so excited about this project one of the reasons why i'm not that bummed that lee daniels is leaving is because this is a movie that I want to see sooner rather than later. I don't think they're rushing it. Hmm. I hope they get the right director. Christian? I buy it. Um, that, uh, that they, as far as like buying whether or not they can continue it on, right? Is that, is that what the buy is? I, absolutely. I mean, I, I bought the fact that Lee Daniels is leaving, yeah. but I, I sell that it's going to impact the movie negatively. I'm, I'm on the same wavelength. And I think that, look, the thing is, too, and I, I usually pitch this guy for when it comes to other acting roles. I actually think that an African-American should direct this. I don't think Condon should do it. Um, and I'm also not a huge fan of, of Condon as a director. But um, it's a I, fair point. I will say that I think 12 years, uh, not 12 years a slave, um, Birth of a Nation is coming out. Mm -hmm. Nate Parker is getting a lot of, he's looking for his next project. Get Nate Parker on this. Uh, it's getting a lot of buzz. I'd like to see what he what he can do with Richard Pryor. Um, Richard Pryor is a guy, you're absolutely right. They've been pushing this movie for a long time. It's one of the mo my most anticipated biopics mm -hmm. that has ever been out. I mean, obviously for our, com our comedy background, but he has a fascinating story. I think that Epps is a great choice to play Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. At one point they had like uh, Marlon Wayans right, and right. it's like and Marlon Wayans can act. I don't want to just because sure. he's the comedy guy. He, he can, but I just don't think he was right for Richard Pryor. I want to see some whether it be a, an F Gary Gray or Ryan Coogler. Um, I want to see um, or even Ava DuVernay do, do, doing it as well too because the, those I really think for this particular movie an African American absolutely for what he meant for the culture, for everything that he just as as far as I really think that it should be 
one I mean, maybe some maybe someone brand new i don't right. know but you know my only issue with that upon hearing it is that i want to make sure that it's age appropriate as far as somebody who was around at least Definitely. as a kid or a teenager that while richard pryor was at the peak of his powers right. doing stand-up i want somebody directing this movie that was sitting at home nate parker's and, almost and 40 son- years old now, i i know i know yeah. you and i argued about nate park yeah. and you were correct so if nate parker is that guy but i want somebody that saw him in the late 70s mm. and just witnessed yeah. this greatness like if somebody's directing a movie about like you know the Rolling Stones or something like that. I want them to be to, to have seen them in concert but, and been overtaken by the artistic force. But to be fair, you can also there there are lots of directors that have directed movies that take place years. Ava DuVernay did did, did, did did Selma. Sure, and, and it's a, you know, a matter of whether or not it's the research. I want right. I want the director to put the research in right. and really and understand what he was all about. I mean, so that that's kind of where I'm coming. Sure, from. I, I just think that if you were able to see Richard Pryor live ever, sure. that would be a nice feather in your cap if you want to direct this movie. How about I, you? Shane? I just I, I just want someone to be the in the director's chair who who understands the material and and uh appreciates richard pryor and i think lee daniels was all of the above and it's unfortunate that he had to drop out but that's what happens sometimes in in contractual uh you know conflictions that happen with scheduling they've got all of the cast all scheduled to start shooting probably at a certain date and that cast they don't want that cast to disappear because some of them are probably going to start up on a tv show or movie they have a window of an opportunity so they have to fill that slot uh, i'm sure they're on the lookout right now for the uh the best possible director they can get yeah. But you Don know, Cheadle. The, I mean, the, just to, Don Cheadle's ahead. not a bad choice. I'm looking at the chat room right yeah. now. They have an interesting proposition that has been fermenting that you get a comedian of note that has directing chops where Louis C.K., somebody like that, or somebody like Steve Martin. I would get Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle is another one. Where if he wanted right. to direct it. Yeah, or even Chris Rock. I mean, I mean, Chris Rock directed himself in top five and did a very good job doing so. So Chris if, Rock is a great If you get somebody one. that cares about the material, and people are saying they don't want Eddie Murphy to do it because Eddie Murphy would Disney-fy it. Eddie Murphy would not Disney-fy Richard Pryor. No. Eddie Murphy grew up loving Richard yeah, Pryor. Yeah. He, he grew up worshiping that guy. Steve McQueen, maybe. Steve, that's another good call, too. I mean, I think that we all are very excited about this project. And I'm just curious for you guys, where does Pryor rank on your... I know Carlin's your favorite of all. Top yeah, three. he's in the, yeah easily top the top five for me. Yeah, I would yeah. say I Carlin, would say, Carlin for sure. Yeah. Carlin's my number one. Louis I love him. Love him. Robin Williams. Yeah. yeah, all those guys are. Yeah, phenomenal. but if you guys have not seen uh, Live on the Sunset Strip in 1977, Richard Pryor's special, he's got tons of specials that are great. That's the best one. That might be the yeah. best comedy performance. I've ever seen and, and a great, it's really great, good. A great story about that about that is that they shot it two nights right they did a yeah. Friday and a Saturday the Friday show did not go well at all it did not go well so Pryor goes back he's working with Paul Mooney who's a great writer and some other guys they, they just Paul dust up Mooney some material. is a genius the Love next night they get to the show Saturday night and Pryor annihilates and that's what they special, used yeah. in the special and it's just it's one of the best ones I've ever seen in my life yeah uh, okay so let's move on to our next buy or sell The latest installment in 20th Century Fox Blue Sky Studios Ice Age franchise is about to crash land in theaters starting July 22nd in the States with Ice Age Collision Course, the fifth film to focus on the animated prehistoric animals. Their next adventure now looks to blast through all the known eras of mankind's technology and beyond, if the new trailer is any indication. It reveals a prehistoric era, a few biblical references, some magical mysticism, and then the future thanks to some alien technology. Ice Age Collision Course Course stars the voices of Ray Romano, Dennis Leary, John Leguizamo, Simon Pegg, Queen Latifah, Sean William Scott, and Jennifer Lopez. The movie opens in theaters July 22nd, 2016. Schnepp, buy or sell the new Collision Course trailer. Yeah, hey, was I, I totally sell this. <laughs> so you, you knew that was going to happen, right? I, I say, yeah, crash land somewhere in my backyard, then I bury it. Um, th- these films are obviously not for me. I hope it makes a billion dollars. I, I'm, you no, know, little, we don't need a, yeah, to make a billion dollars. Eh, maybe seven billion, whatever. I don't care how much money it makes. These are, this is not a fil- you know, like the little squirrel and his nuts. We, we saw the trailer a couple like a month ago, and he's like, you know, in a spaceship. We thought that was funny, and then everything else sucks. And I feel the same way about this trailer. So it's not for me. Yeah, I, I got to sell it, too. And I, I got to say, I'm a little bummed because when you and I did that trailer reaction, it might have been one of the first ones that we did at Collider <laughs> Video. And Schnepp <laughs> and I right. we were like, yeah, we're here. Let's do it. Yeah. And we turned the camera on, and we were shocked at how much we were laughing. Yeah. at the Dude, the squirrel going after the nut in outer space is like... It's great. Yeah. It's such great comedy. It should have been the whole movie. And then we meet everybody else. And Ooh. it's almost like that trailer was trying to hide all the other characters because like, hey, remember the squirrel in the nut? Everybody loves him. And then the other characters come in. And it's like, Ugh. look, you're, you're dealing with a lot of talent here. I mean, uh, Dennis Leary, Ray Romano, Wanda Sykes. There's a lot of great talent. 
that's doing the voices here, but they ain't writing the script. And it just seems like this is going to be another movie that turns into a cash grab. I had hopes after seeing that first trailer. <laughs> this one, now I'm back to expecting what I usually get from Ice Age. Christian? Oh, I sell it. I'm sick of these idiots. <laughs> uh, it's like it's just doing the same thing. You know, when Michael Eisner was running Disney and he was doing all those cash grab direct to Blu-ray, Cinderella 2, 3, 4, and 5, it was a cash grab and it was an insult to the property. But what was great about it is that we didn't even really know that they existed. They just right. popped on there for kids yep. and that was it. But these movies, they keep churning them out and we have to talk about them and we got to watch them enough it stinks and the problem is my daughter four and a half years old wants to see this movie badly and but what hooked her also was the damn squirrel in right. space and then afterwards she'll see everything else but everything else you guys are right it just it just it's lazy it just seems like they don't know what else to do oh we haven't really covered the asteroid Ugh. part yet let's do it it's horrible a, it's, jokes it's, i mean i'm glad horrible. all these stars are the cashing big checks but this is garbage the last one was atrocious Ugh. and they have the balls in this trailer to say the best trilogy ever it's like i get it it's a joke but don't even uh, don't even put those words in there just stop yourself look in this look go, i'm about to say that uh, no no i shouldn't because that sounds stupid this is crazy i don't know if you guys are aware of how monumental what just happened so we're talking about Ice Age, and apparently the trailer is so bad that not even the shit rats would make an appearance <laughs> during Ice Age, which seems like the kind of movie you got. Oh, there uh -oh. they go. Okay, there you go. And you guys didn't like this, shit rats. Can you give me a, a yay or a nay on the... That looks... <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a shit rat happy face to me, though. So no, I, I, no, no. The, the shit rats work in mysterious ways, and I wish I knew so I could end it once and for all. Let's go to our next topic. Okay. Another graphic novel is getting a film adaptation, but there's not a single superhero to be seen unless you count Andre the Giant as a superhero. According to a report from Variety, Andre is a, Andre the Giant, real name Andre Rusimov, is getting a biopic based on the graphic novel Andre the Giant, Closer to Heaven. The seven foot four eighth wonder of the world who died in 1993 helped populari popularize the World Wrestling Federation, becoming one of the world's most recognizable celebrities, also making several film appearances, including most famously as Fezzik in The Princess Bride. The biography recounts the wrestler's life from his earliest days working on the family farm in France to the rise of professional wrestling itself through the World Wrestling Federation. No cast or release date has been set. Christian, buy or sell a movie about Andre the Giant. No more rhymes now. I mean it. Anybody want the peanut uh it's a huge buy it's a huge buy for me but it is with a big cabin uh and I'm no pun intended it is going to be extremely hard to cast this movie how are they going to do it because the problem is what you could do i mean even you cast someone like the rock which they wouldn't because it, but if you cast someone like the rock who is like six four six five whatever he is he compared to andre the giant is al pacino's size right um <laughs> He, the dude was massive, like seven three, seven four, whatever he was, and not just a tall dude, massive, like a planet. And to see what they're gonna do with that, well, are they gonna do kind of maybe do something that like Peter Jackson did with the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings? Is is get I, because I do think, and I don't, and maybe it'll be an opposing point of view here, but I do think they need to get a good actor. I don't think they should hire some a basketball player who had never play, you know, acted a day in his life because I've got to watch a two hour movie with this person in the lead. It's one thing if it's like a smaller role, but this is a two hour movie to make me care about this uh, Andre's life for two. Andre was an endearing figure, like w regardless of what you, his his last run as a heel in the WWE, he was a really. You, he listened to his interviews. He was a, he was the gentle giant. Everything that he did. So I really want to see how they're going to cast it. I actually think they should go in that. Peter Jackson mm -hmm. way because of the I think that they can handle it now with the type of effects. So 10 years ago I'd say no try to find somebody. So that's the route I hope they go. But yes, this is a fascinating story that what he had to go through in his life. I mean it was it was hard for him, man. Like he he went through a lot a lot of pain constantly. He was only what, 43 when he died or something yep. too. So yeah, it's a good story to tell though. Yeah, I, I, I buy it uh, on the merits of his story and what this guy's life was like and how he did popular. He was one of the transcendental figures of the WWF. Oh, him yeah. and Hulk Hogan were the two biggest ones because you knew these guys. I wasn't a wrestling fan growing up, and I, I knew who these guys were. There's a ton of other wrestlers that, you know, I, I had no idea who, who, who Jimmy Snuka was. But he was the Hulk Hogan first. Like he it, yeah, he was, it, he was the on the scene days. first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, when in that whole WrestleMania 3, 3 thing that happened in, like, 87, he was the one that passed the torch, and Hogan wasn't even sure that Andre was going to let him do it. And because, <laughs> it, no, seriously, he was scared out of his mind going into it because Andre had never lost a match, and and whether he was going to let, if Andre wanted to, he could just 
crush Hogan in the middle of the ring in front of the biggest crowd of all time. So that's the kind of guy he was. He knew that the company needed to move for, further. So he was essentially responsible for making Hogan the legend that he is. And our uh, our buddy, the late grade Roddy Piper, had some yeah. great stories that oh, he, he told us about. It just just hanging out with Andre the Giant, being on the road. Because like, well, yeah, you're a wrestler, you're a huge star, but you go on the road when you're when you were in the WWF and you'd hang out with guys. You just be a normal human being, and to have him tell us these stories about Under the Giant. The, that's the movie that we we should be getting to see. The question is again, who do you have play Andre the Giant? I was looking at Cinema Blend as uh, has Robert Mailett. Mm. He's a Canadian former professional wrestler. He's been in such projects like Sherlock and The Strain before. He's six foot eleven, yeah. and if he's six foot eleven, you can make look. Oscar Isaac can play Apocalypse. This guy can play Andre the Giant. Okay, he's not a good actor. So though. I don't know if he's a good actor. Yeah, that's I, the I, thing. You, you need to be able yeah. to pull off some level of acting ability. You don't have to win an Oscar to play Andre the Giant. Okay, how great would it be if he did? <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy this, and I think I, I like what you're saying about using that kind of technology. I think John C. Riley would be fantastic. Wow! Think about him because he played Babe, Babe Ruth, with yeah. some kind of makeup, and they plumped him up, and he looked just like Babe Ruth. He's a little old though now, no? It, Ma the magic uh, yeah, of, you, you the could magic do the Benjamin makeup. Button. You could yeah. do the, the de age Yeah, they could de age yeah. him or re age him or resize it's him. It's Benjamin Button technology. Uh, just I don't talk it. about it. <laughs> the de aging technology that I was referring to yesterday can be used for John C. Riley to be <laughs> Andre the Giant. Stop it, Ellis. <laughs> is he your favorite wrestler of all time? No. Is he up there? Randy Savage is my favorite of all time. Really? Yeah. The uh, oh yeah, gotta yeah. bring in the Randy Savage, brother. <laughs> Bone saw is ready. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. <laughs> and now back to movie talk and our segment opening this week. Natasha, what's in theaters? Money Monster. After losing money on a stock tip, a disgruntled investor, Jack O'Connell, holds a Wall Street guru, George Clooney, and a producer, played by Julia Roberts, hostage on live television. We always love the opening of this week's segment. It's brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. You can get your tickets and showtime information at amctheaters.com. Come. And as far as Money Monster goes, yeah, it's pretty much the wide release. You also have The Darkness coming out, but I don't know if that's being screened at all. Christian and I are going to get to see Money Monster tomorrow night, and the trailer is fabulous. I mean, look, it's directed by Jodie Foster. You have two A-list stars in there. Jack O'Connell's the guy who I think is a rising star in Hollywood. So I really want to see this movie based on the trailer, but there's just something about it where I feel like the trailer is great and the movie's going to let me down. Christian, why do I have this feeling? I want to be the tiebreaker. After I hear from Schnepp, Schnepp why do I have this feeling? Because <laughs> I thought the trailer was horrible, and this is going to be like the okay. lowest money maker of the weekend, is what I predict. Okay, okay, of the new releases. So you think of it's the new releases, do yeah, it's just literally the trailer felt like it's a movie f lost out of time, like it should have been made in 1994. Uh, it seems very predictable. They seem like they show you way too much in the trailer. I was like, ah, just with deductive re-editing, I've seen the movie by watching that trailer, and it doesn't look that interesting to me. They do give away a lot in the trailer. It's, it's not to me like a Martian or Southpaw situation, but you do see a lot of the story play out in the trailer, and it looks kind of like a John Q meets the big short. So Christian, Schnapp doesn't want to see it at all. I have some hope, but I'm nervous. You. I have hope and I'm nervous, but I also don't think it's going to make a lot of money um, because I think people are going to go in thinking that because I think the way that it's pitched and the way that you see these trailers, it does look like a dated movie with movie stars who are trying to sell the movie with you with the George Clooney and Julia Robertson. You can't sell a movie on movie stars anymore, but I actually do think it looks like The Martian in The Martian situation because The Martian, the Martian situation was not... It did not totally. give you the movie. It thought you thought it gave you the movie, and it was completely different. There was a lot of things in that in that trailer that you thought the whole thing was in there, and there was so much more to it. That's what I'm hoping to get from Money Monster. That's what I think we're gonna get. When are you guys seeing it? Uh, Wednesday night. So you guys are gonna do a little schmo thing about yeah, it? Yeah, we'll do a review. It? We right. we'll it's not a little schmo thing. thing. It's a schmo's no worldwide classic. All right, review. relax, yeah. Ellis. Relax. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check our out our YouTube channel, Schnapp. I'm gonna check out the little schmo land thing Schnapp on Wednesday night. Schnapp popped into our X Men Apocalypse <laughs> review the other day because you hadn't seen it yet. So you did a great job. The review's doing very well. Okay. He still hasn't subscribed to our YouTube channel as of yet. But just click I'm, the button. It's going to be fun. I have subscribed. I've been a subscriber for over a year. Thank you over very a much. Year. We really you guys should do it too. Yeah. Subscribe right. to Schmoland. Uh, before we go into mailbag, I want to throw it back to Wendy real quick because, Wendy, which of these stories that we talked about in Buy or Sell, whether it's Andre the Giant or it's Richard Pryor or it's the Ice Age Collision Course trailer, what are people talking about the most in the chat room? Well, I can tell you right now, the Ice Age is a huge sell from the <laughs> chat room. Um, I know people with kids are probably going to go see it for the kids, like yeah. Christian. For the Richard Pryor story, someone says that um, if it, the biopic is not R-rated, it will suck. Oh, yeah. um, and instead yeah. of that, they want to see a Schnepp biopic, <laughs> and John C. Riley can play him. 
Ah, there we go. Okay, so why can't we just have John C. Riley play Schnepp? Why can't Schnepp play on? Can you play Andre the Giant? That was Christian's idea yesterday. Nice yesterday. I think so. I don't know how mm. big my hands are, but maybe I could do that. But that's my point. Is Schnepp's yeah. a big dude, and yeah. he would look like, like that. I look at like a son, like yeah. a little tiny child. Yeah, yeah. he was. He was, he was a giant. giant. That's, he's named Andre the, the Giant for a reason. Like two big things of whiskey. Like the, the, they would take us like a month to finish mm -hmm. he did it in, in a sitting and he wouldn't get drunk <laughs> it's like it's amazing that's amazing that doesn't that definitely doesn't happen to me no okay let's move you on smell whiskey to you mail fall bag. yeah i really do uh mailbag is a segment of the show where we hear from you guys you guys send us your emails at collider video at gmail.com and natasha's going to read a few of them we're also going to save some time at the end of the show for your live twitter questions you can tweet us right now at collider video and ask anything you want in or out of the world of movies natasha what's up in the mailbox. Christopher Fair writes, hey guys and gals, love the show. Your great chemistry and insight always keep me coming back for more. Aww. So quick question. Do you think there is any correlation between where a person is at in their career and their chances of winning an Academy Award? For example, if Christopher Nolan had not made Memento early in his career, but instead were to make it now, do you think it would have a better chance for a best, best picture nomination now that he is a more established filmmaker? I believe it just might. Let me know your thoughts and keep up the great work. That's a great question because, look, I, I don't want to attack the movie because I enjoyed Bridge of Spies, but if Bridge of Spies was not directed by Steven Spielberg, I simply don't think it would have gotten nominated for Best Picture. So I think sometimes the clout of a director helps get a movie nominated, but it also has a lot to do with the studio that releases it and how hard they push it because the Oscars are very political. A lot of people don't want to see They don't want to hear that. They just want to tune in, watch the show, see who gets the statue. But there's campaigns, there's billboards, there's, oh, please vote for our movie. And Memento didn't have any of that. It wasn't just that Nolan was an unknown director. It's that a lot of the marketing campaign for Memento was not based around this movie should win an Oscar. It was just get this movie seen. Mm -hmm. Just get eyeballs on this movie. If Memento were to come out today, I think it would be one of those Academy Award push movies. Now, would it get nominated? I don't know. I don't think it would win a Best Picture, regardless of what year it came out, but it would certainly be a contender because of the name Christopher Nolan. Christian, is that how you see it? I totally agree with that. And I think even going off your point where they, they didn't market it, it was because, again, Nolan not a known property. If it's if it's a Nolan movie now, the second they're already looking, whatever his next World War is World War One, right? right. The mm -hmm. They're already saying, okay, once he's done with it, what's the campaign? They already know that they're gonna have to market it's, it's Nolan. Bat, when he's basically unknown, I think he had one film under his belt before that movie. It was called The Following. That was it. Yeah. Um, so the, you're not going to have the studios real. Oh, this, well, Nolan's got something. He's going to. This thing's going to be amazing. We need to push it. So it's absolutely about who you are, what you've done in the past. There was a great question. One of the best questions I've seen in a long time, by the way, because I really, uh, when you look at that, it does have impact. It's like because you, you when you in the Academy Awards. You're being voted on by your peers, mm -hmm. so the more you know, the more clout. Because you're right, we're just by by a lesser, a, an unknown doesn't get the notoriety. I think that, anybody else. No, <laughs> well, it also doesn't get the cast in the movie right. as well. well so I mean, you don't, sure, you don't sure. get the Tom Hanks. You don't. You right. may get a Ryan Lance, but you don't get it, it, Spielberg. Makes things happen. So it's it's a mixture of all these things. But yes, it absolutely has to do with your reputation, like in any job. To be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, look, look, look if I, I just see the name Dunkirk and I see that Christopher Nolan is doing this movie, and I'm like, oh boy, right. this could be a right. great one. But at the time when Memento was coming out, if you saw the trailer and it said from director Christopher Nolan, you're like, who's that? I don't well, know that is. But you'd also. Say who's Guy Pierce? The, it was an independent film totally. back like you, the world we live in now is much different than when Memento came out. There was actually really was independent cinema, and like like nowadays it doesn't really exist that much. You can see a few a few films here and there, like some a few of the independent uh, right. theaters that are still left open. But back then, independent film was actually thriving and a new thing, and you could break new directors, you could break new stars. And Guy Pierce was a complete unknown. Christopher Nolan was a complete unknown. I remember hearing about Memento from word of mouth. Mouth. So my friends were like, you got to see this movie. It's really cool. It's freaky and weird. Memento, I remember seeing it, blew my mind. I said the same thing to other people. It was a big hit, the underground circuit or whatever you want to call the uh, independent yeah. theaters that were showing it. All of our friends saw it, you know, but it's it's different than like, yeah, if, if Christopher Nolan came out now and made Memento now with Guy Pierce now, who's well known, all of the actors, Carrie Ann Moss, everybody who was in it was kind of like not really that known yet. I think Carrie Ann Moss was just in that, uh, she was in the one artist uh, uh, biopic. Right. Um, it was pre-Matrix. Yeah, it was pre-Matrix. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it, that's a great question, but it's very true. I mean, the, you got to remember, though, like you said, 
the reason a lot of these movies are nominated is because of the campaigning by the studios. It's a it's a fierce and it's a battle. It's like they start that campaign. You're going to see it starting probably in September or October as they start to yeah. try to get all the films that you forgot about that got released earlier this year. But then they drop all those Oscar possible Oscar nominated films starting in September all the way through December. So, I mean, it really is. And then all, all you see are like this, you know, this film, that film, this film. And they're trying to for for your consideration. It's just constantly everywhere you can't escape it for like december january february so yeah. it's like an election know. yeah it really is <laughs> yeah. it's like an election so any of these awards uh type uh, shows myself i always look at it like you know what's the best film not necessarily from the oscars or anything but like from like what we uh, we and our other peers talk about films right. like oh that film was incredible so yeah well maybe the remake will win an oscar yeah. you mentioned carrie ann moss i know some people are asking i finally finished daredevil hooray me <laughs> <laughs> what the f on Netflix this season two? I just finished. It. You just now finished. I just it? finished, dude. No, you you got said Carrie Ann Moss, and I, I know, oh, I know. Yeah, yeah I, I know you have a daughter, so I know you probably had to watch a she lot of Ice it. Age movies. Oh, That's <laughs> right. you show your daughter. Your daughter Why are you showing your daughter ninjas. Ice Age? No, show her Daredevil, know, man. She'll love that hallway scene. Yeah. That's right. Maybe. Okay, let's go to our next question. Lowell Reynolds writes, many of us were expecting Captain America Civil War to make over 200 million, as it should. However, even though it had an amazing opening, it still opened less than we thought. John Campia said in his podcast that Civil War would have done better if Batman v Superman was well received. The other day, I took an Uber home. I told my driver about Civil War, and he told me he was skeptical to see it because he was disappointed in Batman v Superman. Do you think the bad reception of Batman v Superman got had an effect on Civil War's opening? Well, before we get to the question, what's up, Wall? Wall's a great fan. He shows up to a lot really of conventions. Is. Good to hear from you, my friend. Um, I think that it definitely did. And I'm telling you, man, there's something like, like you're talking about your Uber driver or my mom. My mom is not totally aware that DC and Marvel are two totally separate things. All that she knows is that there was a movie about superheroes that were fighting that came out in late March. And now there's another one that's coming out in early May. And that can wear on people. And I think it's going to have that same effect when X-Men Apocalypse comes out. I think that'll temper the box office expectations for that because there's just a little bit of fatigue when you have all these superheroes going against each other time after time. I think that might have taken it from a potential $200 million film down to 181, which is still a fantastic number. That's the thing. Is that, did it have an effect? Sure. It made $180 million. That's a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of money. That is a it's huge a opening. I got yeah. tweets and it, almost, it blew my mind. People were like, oh, big disappointment. No, it's not a big disappointment. It is a huge opening. $180 million is a tremendous success for the student. I think it's already made like $700 million. It's ridiculous. Sure, to some people like that maybe weren't interested in seeing, like, oh, Batman v Superman. And like you said, your mom was just like, superheroes, nah, I'm good. And did that hurt the box office a little bit? Yes, but it's still made. 180 plus million dollars. Yeah. It's, it, who cares if it just took off some of those people? It's a matter of if it would have made like 95 or 100 million sure. and then the drop off was huge. That's the trick. Yeah. What's the drop off like? That's the that's the big thing. If people that are seeing the movie and telling people about it, because that's what happened with Batman v Superman. Mm -hmm. Critics really hit it hard. A lot of fans, some fans really enjoyed it, but a lot of fans didn't like it. Right. And that affected the drop off tremendously. Yeah. Huge drop off second week. So what will the drop off be? Then I'll start talking to whether or not it's a, a hit or miss. Well, yeah. it's got to go up against Shep's movie Money Monster. So look out, <laughs> yeah. Civil War. By far, it made the most money of any Civil War film ever released. And I compared it to the Avengers and the Avengers Age of Ultron, because just as a fan, when I see an ad for Civil War, I'm not processing that as a Captain America movie as much as I am a bunch of superheroes going at it. But when you look at it, because it is a Captain America movie, it's closing that trilogy. So it's the third movie in a trilogy, right? Yes. Which never does that well. And it's a Captain America movie, which the first Avenger and Winter Soldier did great, but they didn't do $181 million opening right. weekend. Right. So that's a huge credit to what this movie did. Yeah, I think it's funny because a lot of people are saying, well, it didn't make as much as the Avengers. It's technically not an Avengers right. film. It is Captain America, though it's you could call it Avengers 2.5 right. or whatever you want to call it everybody's in it but it really is a cap film just with a hell of a lot of co-stars um i made more money in its opening weekend than batman v superman made in its opening weekend which is another weird thing they're both two and a half hours so it's not at the running time so i think did the negative impact of batman v superman hurt the box office perhaps a little bit but what i think you're going to see is this coming weekend's 
uh, drop off will not be nearly as sharp as Batman v Superman because Civil War has nothing but wor good word of mouth. I'd say pr probably 80% good word of mouth. There's some people who didn't like it. I, I, I've read a lot about some people not liking it because it was too funny or it had too many jokes or whatever, but it's not the same kind of negative impact that Batman v Superman had where it dropped like 65% or 70%. I can't remember what the drop off was from the first to the second weekend. I don't think you're going to see that kind of drop off with, with Civil War because so many people still have haven't seen it and then all the people that did see it this past weekend are telling all their friends my god you got to see this movie and they're going to see it this coming weekend well so. that also goes back to what we were saying though because we're all in agreement that even though we don't think it's a a big deal that it did have a little bit of an impact a little we, bit we sure. Think it did. sure oh absolutely but yeah. that goes into what we've been saying forever and campy was saying but for the longest time when he was on the show too was that this is why Marvel doesn't root against DC. Right. Mm -hmm. Marvel's not rooting against Batman v Superman when it's out there going, oh, I can't wait till that movie comes out because this movie's going to stink. Can't wait for it to bomb. Right. Not going to happen because of this reason alone. Yeah. They want the superhero genre. It is a genre. So when people say, is it a fatigue? No, it's a genre. It's here to stay. Stop with the fatigue nonsense. I think it, fatigue does play a factor, though. In, in a little bit of numbers, but it's not But it's not crushing. What, what, what people come out and they say superhero fatigue, what, they're, what they are saying, what they're talking about is that eventually super, it's going to be like an asteroid and it's going to hit it it's going to mm. destroy the genre. No, it's not. Oh, it's, no, that is here to stay. That's but what I'm saying. saying the, the, the fatigue factor over you. time, and I think it's going to hurt X-Men more than it hurts Civil War because, like, like, like look, we, we get a little bit of a break, okay? I'm excited to see Money Monster. Check out our review, okay? Then May 20th happens, and you have comedies. You have The Nice Guys. You have Neighbors 2. You have right. Angry Birds come out. Then the next weekend, X-Men Apocalypse, and it's like another superhero movie, which I liked a lot but here's, to gear up for. But here's why I think the difference is because when you have X-Men, which is a pretty, which is a known franchise, which people are invested in, especially after Days of Future Past. The difference with, like, say, a Civil War and Batman v Superman, similar in nature, mm -hmm. to where you have two are heroes that you love fighting one another. Maybe tones different, but similar storylines. Similar storylines. So that it, you're basically choosing in a way too. I want to see two guys fight, and if you were disappointed, I don't want to see my other two guys fight. As we X Men, you're invested in a way because you're following the storyline that it was already there. I don't think X Men: Days of Future Past is going to open huge. I mean, I, Apocalypse. Yeah. Excuse me. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Apocalypse is going to open up to where we're getting to 170, right. 180. Of that I, I think it'll have a nice opening, and probably around the same that Days of Future Past has. But that's all it really needs to do. I think the fatigue idea is when too many films whether it's a western or science fiction or horror or now the superhero genre are is too much of the same yeah that's what the yeah. where the fatigue sets in like kingsman is technically based off of a comic book called the, the secret service that didn't have any fatigue elements to it because it was a refreshing new look at the spy genre right but it was originally started out as a comic book superhero whatever you want to call it. it's a comic book Fran he started out as a comic book got moved into a theatrical feature film what happens with all of these like brightly colored characters fighting each other and it's just like it all adds up to nothing when you have these kinds of bigger films I'm not saying that Civil War Civil War is incredibly exciting and fun you have Batman v Superman which we won't talk about right now and then you have X-Men Apocalypse coming out those three films all have these giant bigger than life characters all fighting each other with kind of a global impact type of a thing it happening. all felt so cataclysmic that's my yeah, point it's that's... not necessarily the plot where it's like superheroes fighting each other right. but you put on apocalypse there's a lot of famous people in costumes fighting sure. each yeah. other sure. so with like like buildings i saw buildings exploding it, and you stuff. and i saw apocalypse friday night yeah. and then i saw civil war with the nonfiction girlfriend sunday and i walked out of that movie like yeah th these movies are, are really fun but i am ready to see ryan gosling and russell crowe crack some jokes man. yeah like i'm so into that and i hope that x-men stands on its own merit whether it's good or bad or whatever the rest of the critics say about it i hope that it stands on its own merit and not just because people are so tired of superhero movies. You also make a good point where you think of, we, we are lucky enough to what we do that we're going to see all these movies regardless. There's also someone that has to make the decision financially right. to say in, because Batman v Superman was March, but to say, okay, Civil War's in May, mm -hmm. Apocalypse is in May, maybe there's something else with their family that's coming out in May sure. that I've got to decide for my wallet what's the best choice. Angry so Birds. It's, it's, yeah, so, well, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> coming out in May. And, yeah. and for kids and for families yeah. and stuff too, it makes sense that you'd have to make these decisions. So I do think Apocalypse, Apocalypse is going to suffer from that, but I think that's more of a release date than it is is fatigue because I think uh, if Apocalypse would have come out because normally X Men for as long as I know has been coming out in May. Mm -hmm. I think that they if they would have pushed it back to like July or maybe even hit an August date, they probably would have done better. But who knows? We'll see. Can you guys imagine if Batman versus Superman and Civil War opened the same date, like 
They were supposed to, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Been incredible. All right. That was some good mailbag talk, boys. Now let's move on to live Twitter questions. Natasha, we're going to take a few of these right now. What's up first? Scott Salisbury asks, if Wonder Woman flops, will it reflect more poorly on DC movies or on female superhero leads? I think it'll reflect more on DC than it will uh, female superhero leads because there's a lot of those in the pipeline, which I'm very excited about. Whether you talk about Captain Marvel or right. Kevin Feige talking about a new Black Widow movie that could come out, like a born identity situation. I just, and again, I go back to what we were talking about earlier. I just don't see Wonder Woman flopping. I see everything about this movie standing ahead of some of the other things that DC. Now, look, I really hope Suicide Squad is great, okay? I love the trailers for it so far. If that movie is great, then that's going to get a lot of people talking in a positive sense about the future of the DC universe and particularly Wonder Woman and Justice League. So I think there's a lot riding on Wonder Woman. Don't get me wrong. You have a female director, you have a female superhero lead, and I think that part of it is going to knock it out of the park. And even if it doesn't, it's going to be more involved with DC backlash than it will having a female lead. Um, Let's just say, just for, you know, what if Suicide Squad is a gigantic disaster? What if oh, it's please like, no. I'm just saying, please like, no. if you think about it, like, all right, it's coming out in August. What if it's a nightmare of cataclysmic proportions and it's just a super bomb and everybody hates it more than Batman? Then I'm Superman. retiring. But <laughs> I'm just saying, even if that is the case, which I don't think it will be, but just even if that's the case, we still have Wonder Woman and a new refreshed Justice League with Ben Affleck kind of like helping out, is so to speak, as we are hearing through the grapevine. He's executive producing and he's also kind of like, you know, helping almost be a little bit of a Kevin Feige in that situation. So I think even if Suicide Squad is a, is a giant turd, which I don't think it's going to be, but even if that's the case, we still have Wonder Woman and Justice League that are in production. Like Wonder Woman just wrapped. Justice League is being shot right now. So I don't think it's the death knell of the DC, you know, expanded universe, or whatever they're calling it, the DC EU or something like that, right? You just call it the, the, you know, the DC universe. Why not? But um, I also think that DC is so, in, it's still so tied in with what Zack Snyder's vision has been to this point, whereas Wonder Woman can kind of step away from that a little yes. bit. So if Wonder Woman isn't as good as people want it to be or the movie flops, that really hurts DC because it's like, oh, okay, well, it, we're, we still have to win fans over with the Justice League. Oh, and wait, now we can't even get them over with Wonder Woman. That's really going to be a splinter in their finger. I just don't think that's going to happen. I agree. It's The answer is DC all around the board because for, let's go the opposite. So let's say Suicide Squad is amazing. Yep. And it is it is one of the best. It's the best DC Universe movie that we've had so far. And then Wonder Woman fails. Mm. It's still people are not going to just point on point at Gal Gadot. Uh, they're going to point at the writers. They're going right. to point at the director. The untested writer. They're going to yeah. right. That's what they're going to point at yeah. right away. Um, and I, and I let off the show saying how much I think that this movie is going to be the best of all of them. But. If it fails, it's just it's going to be like okay, we made missteps, and the story that we're telling in the DC Cinematic Universe, they didn't come out to see it. They don't want to see that, and I think that now listen, if this one fails, and then Black Widow fails, and then Captain Marvel fails, which I don't think is going to happen, and then Ghost in the Shell, which is not a superhero per se, but right. you know, the female mm -hmm. the female action star is really is Tomb Raider, a whole bunch man. of them. Like, we, yeah. We've right. done some stuff. Like, I mean, there's Star a lot Wars. of really good ones. Yeah, yeah Star Wars, man. So there, yeah. I don't think that that's gonna it's gonna no. reflect because I think that. We, it, our culture has changed as far as the female action star superhero has gone in the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely think it's, it will be a DC It's thing. necessary at this point. We're yeah. looking forward to it. It's like yeah. refreshing. So. Oh, yeah. Those are some of my most anticipated movies. Yeah. By the way, Steph Curry is Ray's father. Okay, let's go to two more Twitter <laughs> questions. Okay, Jordan Anderson asks, what do you guys think of The Rock saying he is going to honor Robin Williams in Jumanji? Um, I, I love hearing it. I love hearing that somebody is going to take uh, the amazing, whatever amazing performance that Robin Williams gave and be aware of that. You know, whether you were a huge Jumanji fan or even if you were a huge Robin Williams fan, to know how many people care about that guy and that he's no longer with us and to be able to say, I'm going to treat that legacy with respect, I think. It's not surprising coming from The Rock because everything that Dwayne T.R. Johnson does seems to be the right move, and he seems to be genuine about it. It doesn't seem like he's just giving lip service. He always seems like he really cares about whatever properties he's involved in, and I don't think this is any different. Yeah, I, I, I love The Rock's comments. I think honoring Robin Williams is the right way to go. I mean, not obviously mimicking him. He would never do that, but he's going to probably take a few steps or a few winks and nods in there to like give a little props to Robin Williams. So I love the, I love the comment. 
The Rock is a guy, you know, I was lucky enough to work with him and, and to watch the way that he paid respect to the wrestlers that came before him. You know, he know he knew how to pay respect, how to pay homage to, you know, to just little things. Even when his early promos, when he used to do, he would he would throw some um, old school references to a Hogan or a Savage and show the, Ric Flair or what came before him. And he's doing the same thing now. He's a student. He's been a student since he started. You watch his performance when he started in like the Scorpion King right. up until something now, like whether it be Faster or Snitch. The guy is learning and tr and wanting to do more stuff. So he absolutely and he knows and he's aware of how much the fans um, loved the late great Robin Williams, myself being one of those fans in Jumanji. So I think he'll be aware. I don't think we're going to see a, The Rock doing a Robin Williams impression, nor should he do that. But he's absolutely going to pay um, homage to that character and what Robin Williams gave to uh, gave us in that great uh, late great performance. Very well said. All right, last Twitter question of the day. Okay, Geeks and Goddesses asks, is there any way for Marvel to get the rights to Namor Submariner? Is it with Fox? Do you want to see that? Uh, John Schnepp, I will defer <laughs> to you. All right, it's a good call. Do we call. need to see? First of all, I always, when I was a kid, I would I would see the comic and I'd be like, oh yeah, it's Submariner. Is it Submariner? Because that sounds like a sandwich place. Sure, you know, you could say it any way you want. I used to say Magneto. I used to say Magneto. It's uh, you know, it's like uh, it's Magneto. Yeah, it is Magneto. Yeah. But I used to say Magneto because right. it's a magnet. So you know, then yeah. you say, find out in the movies it's Magneto. And you're angry like myself. I was like, what? But um, yeah, you could say Submariner. You could say Submariner. <laughs> uh, Namor is, I think, the way you could say it his first name um uh, i think there are some rights issues similar to the one like the situation they have with the hulk why they can't make a standalone hulk movie mm -hmm. is because universal owns like some kind of rights as far as mm -hmm. distribution or whatnot i'm pretty sure that namor the submariner is tied in with i believe it's paramount and universal so there's like a lot of issues Ugh. To go, you know, you're going to see Aquaman way before you ever see Namor is all I could say. I think what Marvel could do is this, the way they're similarly have, you know, been able to put the Hulk in Thor and Avengers and all these other movies because that's not the standalone Hulk movie, which then would, would you know, encounter universal rights. I think there's a workaround where you could see Namor show up in an Avengers film like, you know, I don't know if they would throw him into in the Infinity War, you know, double films or if they would throw him into one of these other films. But I think that's a, a, the right way to introduce him. And, you know, I think that's what's probably going to end up happening. Christian, I always get a headache when we talk about rights issues with studios. But recently we've seen, like, look, Paramount and Universal play very nice with properties. And we've seen, obviously, Sony and Marvel play, be cool. So do you think that there's a chance that we could get, so whether it's Neymar or somebody else, coming over to the MCU? Down the line, sure, just, again, I don't know what the actual rights are and, and how much they want him to play a part in their storytelling. This could be something that after Infinity War, maybe they decide they need him to, to go further in their stories and they make a pitch for him but I don't necessarily know they have a lot of characters right now that they're using and and since the introduction of Spider-Man now they got a lot to work with so I don't think they need to do it yet but that's not to say that they never will you got to think about it though because just like Aquaman Namor when he originally started out in the comic books he was a villain oh really and I mean he's in charge of Atlantis and that's a giant threat like Earth is 75% of water instead of making it Aquaman and a hero related thing you could make Namor and all of the Atlanteans a villain that have to you know the Avengers have to deal with it could and be something like that or something yeah something mm -hmm. like that could work all right well that is all the time we have for today here on Collider Movie Talk I want to thank everybody behind the camera Jonathan over there not paying attention to me but working very very hard over there is Adam Wendy our debut with the live chat very well done Miss Lee Thank you. Thank you very fun. much, Dennis over there, Mark Riley, probably polishing his belt, and everybody here, the front of the camera, joining me today, John Schnepp. Where can everybody find you? Hey, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Up. And I hear you're in a great X-Men Apocalypse review. That hey, sounds exciting. Yeah. I want to go to that YouTube channel. Christian, do you have any information on that? Well, it's funny you say that, Mark. You can actually go to YouTube.com slash no and subscribe and watch that review. Uh, we knocked it's up that right out of I the park. I like that. That was terrible. Bam. Um, so, yeah, you want Christian Harlov at Twitter and Instagram. Jedi Council this Thursday. If you haven't read Bloodline, you haven't checked out Bloodline, the book, I did an interview with the author, so you go and check that as well. Check out our commentary that we did for The Winter Soldier. We're doing a commentary on Deadpool. We're doing a commentary on Days of Future Past, all coming up pretty soon. And with all the superhero stuff, make sure you guys also watch Collider Heroes every Tuesday, because that guy right there, John Schnepp, who will be playing Andre the Giant sometime in the near future, is the host of that program. That's not a good early audition. We hope uh, it gets better. Fired. <laughs> Natasha Martinez, where can everybody find you? You guys 
guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And you guys can find me this weekend if you're in Texas. I know it's a big state, but if you make it over to Houston, I'll be performing at the Improv there all weekend long, Thursday through Sunday. You guys can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. Up upcoming dates include Cincinnati and Boston. I'm on Twitter at MarkEllisLive. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.